happening. Uh. So this is very casual. Uh, I guess um, part of it is uh, because we cannot meet physically, you know, our monthly uh, uh, event. So this is a way to keep in touch and to also update each other on what's happening, you know, sharing the latest happenings. And then um, um, we, we thought we will make the discussion more interesting by sharing uh, clips on uh, environmental issues. So last week we talked about, we showed a, a video on about uh, land reclamation. And then this week it's more of a, a general, just a clip on climate change. And it's just nice to hear what are your perspective, your worries, your fears, your questions, and to spark a discussion lah, basically. So um, I thought maybe for a start, we can just uh, do a round of introduction and uh, just say your name and maybe something about yourself. It can be your profession, if you like to, or your hobby or something that you enjoy doing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then we'll see where we go from there. Then we'll, we'll screen the video and then, and then we can have a chat about it. How about that? Cool. So I'll, I'll start. So uh, I'm Adrian, uh, I think most of you know. And you know something about me. Uh, okay, I'll just say yeah. Uh, so so I've been uh, enjoying baking during this time. Uh, I think James has seen some of my uh, food experiments. Uh, my dumplings that look like curry puffs, and, <laughs> and my and my breads. Yeah. So that that's something that's uh, about me. So uh, over to you, Josh. Oh, thanks so much, Adriana. Thank you so much for facilitating and organizing this yet again. Um, uh, my name is Josh, I think you probably all know that. Um, and uh, yeah, a little bit uh, about kind of what's been happening. Uh, it was great having a long weekend. Did some um, amazing stuff with uh, Love is an Action. Sadly, I didn't get out talking, uh, but we're almost there in the signing of the uh, app being developed. Um, chit chatted to a um, to a, a, a guy who's launching Love and Kai. Um, now this is a book that's uh, got about 56 people from around the world have submitted stories and, and images. Uh, so I've, I've authored a short story to go uh, into that. That'll be happening on the 8th of June, uh, coming out for World Ocean Day. Uh, and, um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, we're going to be doing that next Sunday, uh, the 7th, 7th of June. Uh, we'll be having a little podcast like this uh, and doing that. Uh, this Friday, I'm doing a podcast with a group in Kuala Lumpur, so hope to share that with the group as well. Um, Instagram, yeah, 2,000 followers. Uh, wow! 2,000 and increasing. Uh, so we, we, we're starting to do amazing stuff. Um, I just have messages from people in uh, Kutavaru, uh, two people yeah. in the Philippines, um, how can they join our organization? How can they start up the Libby Club um, in their local areas? So, you know, as a team, we need to work out how we're how we going to do that. Um, so it's just some really cool stuff happening. So, you know, our, our passion and drive that we started here um, is just going to take us to incredible places. So that's a, that quick update from me. It's not that quick, but uh, freelance, over to you. Wow, thanks uh, so much guys for facilitating this Zoom session um, and I'm so happy to be here and listening to all the progress of LIA and the Glitter Club, Club and the Glitter Club as well. And it's also nice to be able to see some other team members on here which I've not uh, met before and you know, uh, is in a way this is a good session for you know, sharing of our progresses and in a way of just hanging out with our team. I know this period can be tough for us getting to know each other and you know, sharing our progress but you know, we try to make do of what we can and it's really nice even though during this session that the Instagram numbers is soaring up higher and higher each day and it's really nice to see that and you know, we can do it even at this period and I'm rooting. Um, any, I'm silent. Uh, I work for a photography company during this period. I've got nothing much to do uh, in terms of photography. Um, but I've been working elsewhere and on my hobbies as well. I shoot um, some other abstract uh, arts, uh, but it's very tough these days. So LA is um, hopefully going to keep me occupied in the next couple of upcoming weeks. <laughs> Over to you, James. Oh, um, nothing much. I'm a teacher. So this is now the school holiday. So lazing around and 
just waiting for the school to reopen and all, all hell break loose. <laughs> is it going to continue to be online like classes or are you going to be teaching? Alternate weeks uh, because wow. yeah, teachers teach different levels so some levels will be in school, some levels will not be in school so we are actually not too sure how it will be. So the first week is going to be chaotic. So. Okay, okay. Well, good luck man. Is, is Melissa still with us or she dropped out? Uh, I think they could have dropped out. Dropped out, huh? Yeah, okay. I think she will join us as we go along. So maybe I will start by screening the clip. I'm not sure if you have seen it. So um, this gentleman, his name is Bill. So how did I find out about him? Okay, I was reading a book um, and I realized that he is one. His name is Bill. Uh, sorry, I forgot his last name, but he he authored a book in the 1980s or, or 90s, like, you know, talking about uh, climate change and what, what you know um, and what may be happening so he's actually quite a, a rep, like he's got a good reputation now you know in terms of his research and he's written quite a few books and I've, I've uh, looked through a bit a few of them at the uh, you know this scribe you know and, and uh, yeah and anyway he, he, he made a very concise uh, explanation about you know climate change and also I thought wow you know we can just uh, listen and so okay, I'm just going to uh, keep quiet and then play the video. Okay, enjoy. So let me just share my screen. Hi, uh, my name's Bill McKibben. I, I teach at Middlebury College in Vermont. Way back in 1989, I wrote what's usually called the first book for a general audience on global warming, a book which came out in a bunch of languages and was serialized in the New Yorker magazine. The robust public debate on climate science only goes back about that far, uh, less than 30 years. So I'm here today with a few friends to try and bring you up to date on climate science, climate solutions, really where we stand right now. I'm joined by Mustafa Ali, until recently the longtime head of the environmental justice programs at the Environmental Protection Agency, by the actor and activist Maggie Gyllenhaal, Catherine Hayhoe, who runs the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech, and by the planet's preeminent climate scientist, James Hansen, who was in charge of NASA's Earth Science Program for many, many years. I said a minute ago that society is only focused on the threat of global warming for about 30 years. But scientists began to focus on the question long before that, really as far back as the 1820s, when the French scientist Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier realized that uh, given its distance from the sun, the Earth should be much cooler than it actually is. In fact, the average surface temperature, all else being equal, should be right around zero degrees Fahrenheit, much like the moon. He theorized that something in the Earth's atmosphere must be acting as an insulating layer and, and trapping some of the sun's heat here on Earth. It was a pioneering female scientist, Eunice Foote, who was among the first to realize that carbon dioxide was a key part of that insulating layer. In the early 1850s, she pumped the air out of a glass tube and filled it with CO2, using a thermometer to show that the sun's rays heated it more than they did regular air. Her paper concluded that, quote, an atmosphere of that gas would give our Earth a high temperature. The work was duplicated and extended three years later by the famous scientist and mountaineer John Tyndall. It's just possibly, possibly possible that one reason we remember him and not her is because he was a man. In any event, another 50 years passed and the great Swedish chemist Svant Arrhenius, who would later win the Nobel Prize, pointed out that because we had begun to burn coal to power our industry and heat our homes, it stood to reason that eventually the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere would increase enough to heat the planet. That's because when you burn coal or oil or gas, you give off CO2, and quite a bit, actually. A gallon of gas weighs about six pounds, and since it's 87% carbon, it gives off about 5.5 pounds of carbon when you burn it. Each carbon atom combines with two oxygen atoms from the atmosphere, CO2, remember, so that the six pound gallon of gasoline actually produces about 20 pounds of CO2 when it burns. Anyway, 
uh, Arrhenius' calculations were mostly ignored for the first half of the 20th century. Most people who thought about the question at all concluded that the vast oceans would soak up any extra CO2 that humans emitted, so no problem. But in the 1950s, a pair of ocean scientists, Roger Revell, Hans Seuss, figured out that the upper layers of the ocean were actually pretty well saturated with CO2, so they guessed it must be accumulating in the atmosphere instead. They found a young scientist, Charles Keeling, to test the hypothesis. He built a small CO2 monitoring station in a hut on the side of the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. He turned on the instrument in 1959. Within a year, it was clear that, indeed, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was increasing. It's gone up every year since. This graph, the, the Keeling curve, is one of the most famous charts in all of science. The annual wiggle is because when spring comes to the northern hemisphere, the plants soak up a lot of CO2, and then when they die in the fall, they give it off. But every year, the curve keeps going higher because we keep burning coal and gas and oil. We still didn't know, however, how much CO2 was too much CO2, where the danger line lay precisely. Climate's what scientists call a noisy system. The temperature goes up and down from year to year and place to place. They needed more computing power to be able to figure out exactly where the danger zone lay. Some of the first scientists to conclude that we were beginning a dangerous heating of the Earth work for the biggest oil companies. In July of 1977, Exxon's chief scientist told the company's top management team that there is general scientific agreement that burning fossil fuels was warming the climate. A year later in 1978, the executive of the world's largest oil company got a more explicit warning. Doubling the amount of carbon in an atmosphere would raise the temperature four to five degrees Fahrenheit. They believed him and began doing things like building drilling rigs to accommodate the sea level rise they knew would follow, but they didn't tell the rest of us. Instead, uh, it took someone else to issue the public warning, and that someone else was Jim Hansen, who we've met already. By 1988, he was ready to tell a congressional committee the bad news. Jim, can, can you recall that moment for us? Yeah, well, the story became pretty clear during the 1980s because we had been doing modeling for a number of years and realized that the planet was really warming and it was consistent with uh, what we were calculating in the climate model. And by 1988, we had a paper uh, accepted for publication in Journal of Geophysical Research. So I thought it was possible to make a pretty strong statement. And because the weather was so hot at that time, the statement got a lot of attention. Since then, the news has grown steadily worse as climate change and its effects have come far more rapidly than we hoped. The rise in temperatures has been remarkable. 2014 was the hottest year ever recorded on our planet until 2015 smashed that record, until 2016 smashed that record. We've seen the same kind of anomalies in the US. This past February, for instance, we had 29 new all-time low temperature records in the US and 4,498 new high temperature records. Last summer, we saw that. Adrian, the sound dropped out. Sorry? The sound dropped out. Oh, uh, can you guys hear no? No, I cannot hear. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay.
I'm just to relax a bit. Covered the Arctic. No. You can see how fast it's falling right through 2016. It's enough heat to have destabilized the vast glaciers and ice sheets of the Antarctic. It's now bleached huge swaths of the world's coral reefs. The level of the world's oceans has begun to rise. Here's something important to remember. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That means we get more drought in arid areas and more downpour in wet areas. Where I live in the Northeast United States, the number of huge downpour rainstorms has increased more than 70%. Sea level rise is, in my opinion, the biggest issue because it has the potential to hand young people a climate system that's out of their control. If the ocean warms enough that it's going to melt the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from Greenland and Antarctica into the ocean, then it could lock in sea level rise of several meters. That would mean we would lose all coastal cities on a time scale that's difficult to predict, but could be as soon as 50 years and is unlikely to be more than 150 years if we continue to emit greenhouse gases rapidly. And how the moving of people away from the shore is going to dwarf what we've seen in recent years. It may, frankly, make the planet ungovernable. All of these enormous effects are happening in the early stages of global warming. So far, we've increased the planet's temperature barely more than a degree Celsius. But remember that even Exxon scientists warned we face temperature rises three times that large or more. That's why even the Pentagon has warned that instability caused by climate change is among their greatest fears. Sometimes people say, sure, the climate's obviously warming, but maybe this is just a natural cycle. How do we know it's caused by humans? This may be the most common objection to taking climate change seriously, and so it's precisely the one that scientists have studied most carefully. One of those scientists is Catherine Hayhoe at Texas Tech, and she can bring us up to date on the latest answers. We know that climate has changed before. It was warmer than when there were dinosaurs, it was colder during the Ice Age. So how do we know it's not just a natural cycle this time? To answer that question, we look at all of the different reasons that have caused climate to change in the past. One of the biggest reasons why climate has changed in the past is the sun. Over time, the sun's energy gets brighter, and then it gets a little dimmer. When we get more energy from the sun, we get warmer. When we get less energy from the sun, we get cooler. So has the sun's energy been going up the last few decades and centuries? Well, over the early 1900s, the sun's energy did go up a little bit. But since the 1970s, it's been going down. So if our temperature were controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. But what about those natural cycles that we have inside the Earth's climate system, like El Nino, for example? We understand those cycles. Us atmospheric scientists are the ones who study them. And while they still have some mysteries to be uncovered, we understand the basics quite well. And the basics are this. These natural cycles mostly just redistribute heat around the Earth's system. They don't create it or destroy it, they just move it around. So one place gets warmer, another place gets cooler. Heat goes from the ocean into the atmosphere and then back from the atmosphere into the ocean. The net effect of natural cycles inside the climate system over the past 100 years or so has been basically null. They can't cause a huge warming or a huge cooling. So only when each of these natural suspects has an alibi can we finally say, could it be something else? Every scientific body on Earth has said the same thing by now. Global warming is caused by humans and it's very real. And if for some reason you don't trust scientists, then ask the insurance industry, which is the part of our economy in charge of analyzing risk. As the world's largest insurance company said, quote, the only plausible explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is global warming. So, uh, climate change, to sum up, is the result of fairly simple physics as scientists first started to realize more than 200 years ago. The molecular structure of CO2 traps heat near the planet that would otherwise radiate back out to space. That's it. 
Because their warnings have been largely ignored by politicians, scientists have become increasingly active in the fight for solutions. We'll talk more about those solutions in the next video. Hey, I, I think we have a few friends who joined us while the uh, video was showing. Uh, I, yeah, was, we, we started uh, earlier. Maybe uh, we, we had a round of introductions. So, oh dear, did my screen freeze? Sorry, I think I'm my my I my uh I just froze for a bit. Yeah. So so I'm just uh suggesting like uh for those who just join us, you would really like to just uh say hello, maybe introduce yourself and say something you know about uh your name and something about yourself. Just now we, we went through a round of introduction. So I'm I'm Adrian by the way. Cool, thanks Adrian. Hey, I'm Josh and we have got a couple of people who have just joined us. I just sent a note out on WhatsApp um, to welcome Kyle. Kyle lives in Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah? Hi, Kyle. Welcome to uh, the Leader Club Lovers in Action. Um, and you want to say uh, just to say hi to everybody here. I can't hear you. Are you on mute? You're. Maybe on mute or or like me, the Bluetooth never connects. Like <laughs> uh. no worries. So where is Sorry, Kyle? We can't from hear you, from? Kyle. Uh, but we can say hi, hi to Melissa. Yeah, hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Melissa maybe has audio problems as well. Uh, Melissa's on Palau Tiaman. She's a scuba diving instructor on Palau Tiaman. Uh, so I know the internet is not that strong there. Uh, Mel puts up diving videos every Tuesday and Friday on her uh, YouTube channel. So okay. you check her out on her name. And you can no doubt get back to it. And we've got Paul as well. You Paul. Hi. Sorry I'm late. No worries. You want to uh, say something about yourself, what you do, what you enjoy, or something? We had a yeah, round introduction. Sorry about I'm late just now. I was having no worries. Time. No yeah. worries, no worries. Yeah, so I'm from Kodabari as well. Hi, Kyle. So you, you guys are from the same hometown? Like, yes, yeah, same I'm from, from Kodabari. Wow. Okay, okay. Cool. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Kota Barunians. Yeah. Kota Barunians. Yeah. So, I, I don't know how much of the video uh, you guys caught. Um, I apologize for the audio in the middle. Um, uh, but when I when I first watched the video, yeah, it was. Um, Quite depressing, uh. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know. Then I, I was telling, I was telling Josh because uh, after watching the video, I, I started reading more stuff about climate change, and I started reading a book called On Fire, um, and then I became even more depressed. <laughs> I was like, oh no, <laughs> you know what can we do? And then, yeah, so I mean that was my my initial reaction, uh. They, they, they had there's a follow up video which uh, the same group of people talk about solutions. So Bill also talked about you know uh, solutions in terms of renewable energy like wind and solar. So uh, that's a more hopeful message. Uh, but I'm I'm just curious to hear from the rest. You know what were your initial reactions when you watched the video? You know did, did you have any questions, observations, or uh, how do you feel after uh, hearing hearing that? Oh, you know about the, all all the, the things in the video. Feel free to unmute your mics and share. This one is uh, very casual. It's, it's not, a, not a meeting, you know, not a work meeting. So feel free to talk over each other. And yeah, it's fine. It's a small group anyway. 
Yeah. And Carl, you can feel free to type. Uh, we can read your. Um, we can we can read out some of your comments or questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool idea, Adrian. Like if you can, mm. if you cannot communicate with us, maybe just to open the chat box and then. Uh, yeah. We can chat that way. I'll, I'll keep my eyes on the chat box. So if I see Carl, Melissa, I I read out some of your. Uh, comments and stuff, yeah. I don't know, yeah. So, so I mean, what, what do you I, think? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, mean, Josh, I, just don't, I don't get it that, that uh, governments and all the rest of it can just say there's no climate change. I mean, it just doesn't seem to make sense that uh, mm -hmm. with all the facts kind of out there, I mean, you know, why are people making up facts that there is? And surely it's, it's just the other way around. Yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of agree because um, I think it's it's good to uh, to kind of watch these documentaries every now and again. Uh, of course, there's no doubt there's always climate change, climate deniers out there, but mm. statistics is always showing factual information, and you know, mm. um, it's it's always good to watch these things, even though it's depressing because it, yeah. for personally, the depression um, feel that I get from this is kind of like. Uh, a fuel to drive me out to want to change it, you know, um, inspire others to try to help this out, you know. Yeah, sure, the, the climate is, is going downhill at the moment, well, but what can we do to, to still try to make it less, um, less terrible for the future generations, for our kids, you know, for, for, for I don't know, for our nephews and nieces. Um, yeah. it, it's going to still be bad, but we can try to preserve it as much as we can. You know, it's not yeah. you know, the end. We can still do something about it, and I think that's yeah. that's what people are still struggling with. They feel like there's nothing that they can do to help. But you know, the, here here we are. We're trying to uh, convey a message that yes, we can do something to help. Every little bit counts, and and it's the, that's the tagline of the message that every little piece matters, and and it's uh, what we're trying to strive for. That's what the message I'm getting at. Chief Philan, you you made a very very good point. You know, as I started reading more about climate change, um, some, some commentators were saying that, you know, climate change is not like a war or it's not like uh, something big, you know, that, that happened overnight. Uh, but it is due to, uh, they call it a co condition choices. Uh, means our day-to-day -day decision and choices very accum cumulatively adds up. So um, when, I, when I read that, I, I felt a bit more hopeful. You know, then then that means that um, uh, because it's not because of one main reason, you know, like oh, some something exploded somewhere, and then, but it's because everybody um, made certain choices, you know, and then it slowly accumulated over the years. It didn't happen overnight, you know, yeah. and, and that means that, okay, you know, and and I think what proved to me was um, you know, now you know, I, I think during this time where people consume less, travel less. Uh, immediately the CO two level drops. You know the, you know like Beijing. You know the the the, the sky cleared up. You know and all these things. So it just it again reinforced the fact that hey, you know uh, things uh, can change. And and yeah. and the, this COVID nineteen proved it. And 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 also to your point where um, uh, having proof. You know I I, I think um, you see the weather changes around the world. Uh, you, you know, like in Australia, the, the high, I mean the fires, but also the, the heat or in places where there's drought and then there's a high rainfall. You know, like in one part of the video, you, the guy was there, the, the bill was trying to explain why climate change results in, you know, high downfall, uh, rainfall in one area and drought in other areas. Something about, I can't remember. Lah. Yeah, but some about, about, yeah, maybe one of you can explain. Um, but yeah, you know, so I mean, I, I see, you know, I mean, I mean, you, you read the newspaper and you, you see all these things happening. La. Yeah. Anyway, those are some of my reflections. Sorry to dominate the discussion. <laughs> I had more time to think about it. So I'm just reading what Kyle said. Oh, Kyle said, it is great to see you guys. Yeah. Yes. But it, it, it always, I mean, it's just kind of gets to me that humans are so kind of like blur, unless it actually impacts them 
directly, and even then they're blurred. I mean, look at the Australians. I mean, they had all of those uh, bushfires, right? And everything is dying, and people are dying, and animals are dying, and all of that. All they do is blame the government. Oh, Scott Morrison didn't cut down enough trees. Oh, Scott Morrison did. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know what I mean? Even though they're, they're, their homes are on fire and all the rest of it, they blame the government because the government has to do everything for them. So even when you have direct impact, still people blur. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, just carry on the way you, you carry on. How do, I don't know how you, how, how you get people to connect the dots so that they understand how that how it works. Yeah, they also want the great exporters of coals right to China, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. No, that's what I read in the newspaper. Yeah. And then James, you have any thoughts as a teacher? And you're probably the most intellectual amongst all of us. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, climate, uh, I'm not a geography teacher, uh, but for yeah. in terms of climate change, right? Yeah, I'm a little bit more cynical. You really how I see it is like if mm. you are, if you are the government, you have, mm. uh, you have a vested interest to ensure that it doesn't affect you. But most governments are very short lived. They are there for mm. a term, two terms, ten years, twenty years, and I think that's max. They are yeah. not able to see the long term impact much. And for most mm. individuals, right. Sadly speaking, most of us will not be able to see the long-term impact of the uh, of climate change. And in that in that sense, right, I, this is also one of the areas of philanthropy, right, which I think that is is hard to gain traction. It's hard to gain supporters because I mean, compared to a crime kid, a war, mm. a financial assistance or first aid, climate mm. change is something that is very abstract and it's complicated because of that right it's mm. hard to it's hard to put in effort i think sometimes i mean to, to me right if you well. ask, yeah yeah if you ask me about it in terms of all the uh, various types of uh, uh, charity work and stuff right mm. climate change is difficult unless you 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 personally work in uh, like agriculture horticulture or you work in the oceans where you see a uh, impact. If not, you're in a very urbanized setting, right? It's, climate change is just a very fancy full way of saying things, but at the end of the day, right, it, it, it can't really impact you. And because we are not able to feel that impact, right? Sometimes it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for us to, to it's harder for me, like, I mean, if you mm. talk about personal experience, I find it harder to be vested yeah. with vested interest in climate change agenda compared to the other uh, staff that are probably more interested. Yeah. But that's just me. Yeah. Yeah. So because it's, it's long, because it's long term, uh, because it's more, uh, it probably affects the generation after, uh, uh, I guess then people find it easier to ignore. I mean, I mean if I'm paraphrasing what you said, I mean, that, that's a good point. Um, yeah. Interestingly, the Singapore government is thinking of building a four meter wall around the, the coastal. Yeah. Just we have nowhere head. to run. Huh? Yeah, we have no. The highest place you can go is Bukit Timah Hill, which is not very high. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, Josh, you're on, you're on 30th floor in your, in your <laughs> flat. So maybe 33 you were, stories up. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. I'm going to get my feet wet when I go to Fairprice. But. Uh, but but it's interesting. It's, it's the first time the Singapore government is uh put a polit uh climate change hmm. agenda in their manifesto. So obviously, you know, oh, like yeah, yeah. you know, you know, the the re-elections are coming. So they have put it in there because I'm I'm sure it caters to a certain segment of the voters. But I was wow, I was quite surprised that he actually talked about it during his national. I said national day. I don't know what speech lah, but he, he talked about it uh recently and, and emphasized about it. Wow. You know, that means it must be quite real. Uh. Yeah, so maybe, hey, we've got a couple of people from Kutabaru. So like, you know, Paul and Kyle, what, what is the, what, I mean, I guess what's the local sentiment when it comes to kind of like rubbish and waste and, and you know, the ocean. I mean, you guys are the, the stepping stones to go to uh, Palau and the 
Dan and mm -hmm. all of these amazing folks with some of the best diving in the world. Um, what do you think around, you know, kind of like local government, local awareness and stuff like that? Oh, but local government, I don't think that they put a lot of effort in this though. Because when you come to like Kotobaru, mm. not only in Kotobaru, I think that um, in Malaysia, uh, like, uh, most of the places that uh, you can see a lot of rabbits everywhere. And I think the most difference is um, maybe the government has put more effort in. I mean, the difference here and Malaysia, like, not from Malaysia. Like. I think the government put more effort in like people cleaning. Mm. You can see people cleaning everywhere, like here in Singapore, but in Malaysia, I don't think like a lot. Like. Do, you, do you think the people talk about it? I mean, like the in Malaysia, do you think the people are aware or, or, or they are maybe struggling day to day and then they don't have time to even think about all this issue? I don't know what's your mm. sense. Like, yeah, and then I think you know the most, the most, the, the worst part is sometimes when you're driving, you still can see like people throwing rubbish out from the car. Are you okay? Okay. Yeah, that's true. So still, that's so sad to see. And then like in, um, I think the most important part uh, is the awareness. Uh, the people have to know like. What is the right thing to do? What is the what mm. they shouldn't do? Mm. And they do, they, do, they, do they do they create this awareness in school? I I'm, I'm just wondering like do they do they, do they have all this uh teach like, I don't know environmental issues in school? Yeah. Mm. In school. Yeah. Uh, uh, like my school, uh, when I was studying, uh, they don't have a lot of education in this. I think, uh, no, uh, not a lot. Yeah, my time also don't have. James, do they, do they, do they teach now in schools? Like, is it emphasized in geography or do they? Mm. In a way, I think so, yeah. I mean, they, I they do. See... Uh, uh, increasing awareness and talking about it. and there are some students who are quite uh, enthusiastic about all this so I think that's good I mean yeah in a way it's a little bit of a token effort I see we, I think we can still do more but at least it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's increasing uh, over the years uh, there's yeah. no world environment days and etc and sometimes during April there's the, the Earth Day or one hour of uh, they switch off electricity, right? You you read some yeah. schools they will get the the prefects or counselors to go and talk about it to raise the awareness. Okay. Yeah, there's there's no like activity like that in the school. Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes they yeah. not much lah, but we see an increasing upward trend. I think. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Huh? That's good. Just a yeah. Yeah. I remember the eight. You know, how old the Greta turn turn ball? Oh, the, okay. the, the, yeah. So when I actually read the book on fire, it actually gave a more a lot more context about her. That you know the media portray her as an angry young girl. You know, yeah, yeah, not yeah. shooting from the hip. You know, not not. But actually, when I read the context of her, her education and why she she's actually she suffers from uh, autism. Uh, mm. autism spectrum and then so the book sort of gave a bit more context uh, you know why um, how they behave and how she why she's reacting the way she is and and how she became a mouthpiece and she she was one person single person she started uh, protests in I don't know where uh, it's, I think it's either the White House or government building. so she was the only one she started holding a placard um, Every Friday, she stopped school and she did a protest. And then from there, she more and more people saw her and then started, you know, they picked up momentum. And then it, it created a movement across the United States where all the students, you know, started. So uh, when I read that, I said, like, oh, wow, you know, 
I, I see a different light, you know, on, on how the, and then how she was pushed in the media. And, and, I re- and the book gave a few quotes, you know, what she said. She doesn't mean her word. Lah. She, 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 she was, I think she doesn't have that social, you know, autism, maybe they, they lack some, I don't know, like, cannot read body language. Or, so she, she doesn't mean her word. She just say it as it is. Lah. But, uh, I was more sympathetic of, of her after I, yeah, I read a bit more. Yeah. Oh, wait, there's a comment from Carl. I'll just read. She says, I think in Malaysia, we, we lack the education on global warming. Uh, we lack the awareness and environmental uh, as well. Uh, she's so sad right? because Malaysia has so much uh, like uh, land and, and resources. You know, agriculture. Yeah. yeah, resources, agriculture, world's what largest what rubber exporter, palm oil, tin, mining. Oh, oil. Yeah. You have everything. But yeah, but maybe the education I think. And people don't put concern on everything. Yeah, like everything like not only about like climate change or mm. something, but everything like people just mind their own business. You know, I I I kind of find it really interesting, like Paul's comment before, in the sense of you know awareness and education and you know, people you know, doing the right thing. And I think that you, you see a lot of organizations um, yeah, in, in, in the environmental kind of space. And a lot of them try to get people to do the right thing by guilt, yeah? Making them feel guilty, yeah? You, you, you do the right thing. But, but I, you know, seriously, that's why, you know, for lovers in action, I would rather celebrate everything that we do rather than try and get people to change by guilt because fundamentally people know the right thing. People know that if you're driving down a road, it's the wrong thing to throw your rubbish out the window. I mean, yeah, we're taught that way. It's intrinsic. You know, most people on the planet uh, have a conscience. You know, those that don't are typically kind of psycho killers who are already locked up in prison. Um, most of us have a conscience and we, we still do know the difference between right so when it does come to just like throwing that rubbish or kind of whatever, we actually do know it's wrong. Um, it's kind of the case that, I mean, it's like somebody who smokes, it's like somebody who kind of does whatever you say, oh, I don't smoke, and they just continue to smoke. Yeah? They know that it's bad for their health, they know that it's wrong, they know that it's damaging them, but they, but they continue to do it. We all have a conscience. So, you know, I think that it's, 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 we change the way we portray ourselves in the sense that we celebrate every time uh, you know, somebody picks up a piece of rubbish. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we work that way, then we lead by example. I mean, Taiwan just goes in a way. I've just started to doing some research and we really wanted to find out how Taiwan turned themselves around from being the rubbish dump of Asia 20, 25 years ago uh, into being the cleanest you know, country in Asia without the huge cost of having people walking around behind them and cleaning out. You know, and they just did kind of three fundamental things. You know, they taught kids at school. So you stay back 20 minutes after school uh, and you clean your desk and you clean your schoolyard and you clean everything and everything is clean when you go home and then when you come back the next morning, everything is clean. They took rubbish bins away. So they said, we're not going to give you a place to throw your rubbish. Um, you need to take it home with you and deal with this the right way. And then also, if you don't, we're more than happy for anybody on the street. Um, and they actually set up secret cameras. People set up to do that. Um, to take a photo of you, you know, making our city dirty by, by throwing up and send it in, and, and you will get fined for, for doing that. So it came back to your know, public conference and stuff. Like and then they said, for every piece of recyclable uh, that you bring in, we'll give you money. So if you do the right thing and you deposit the. And they have musical rubbish trucks. What the? Seriously, people run downstairs when they hear that, like Mr. Whippy, they run downstairs when they hear the truck go past playing the jingle and they take their, their recyclables down and basically then they're credited uh, for the recyclables that they hand over to the truck. And that's where the truck goes and recycles uh, all of the things. So three really simple steps, right from young, they're poor. Uh, about, yeah, just about being clean and tidy. And I think we all know how to do that. So, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know which way 
I just can't believe that it's such a simple model and yet nobody else has really hooked onto it in the last like, in the last twenty years since Taiwan. So, wow. It sounds like it sounds like you're saying things like um, more positive reinforcement, you know, um, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we can change the world through guilt. Um, yeah, I think exactly. I think it has to be positive reinforcement. I think it has to yeah. be it has to be awareness, but it can't be education because we can't teach people to have a conscience that they have one. And intrinsically, we know the difference between right and wrong. It's awareness about the consequences of if we do the wrong thing, and then how that actually impacts us. It's because if if our life is if our life is less easy because of that impact. Um, then we're more than likely to kind of do the right thing. I, Thanks, Philan. Um, yeah, I, I just want to, yeah, Philan, I think uh, Philan says he, he might have to jump off. Philan, uh, what's your comment before what, you go? Before you yeah, head to do my work? <laughs> uh, I, I actually agree with, with, with what Josh said. Um, I actually, I, still, I think I still have a bit of a different view on it because growing up in Singapore, we were engraved in our minds uh, from school, like saying drugs is bad, literacy is bad. Um, but okay, then they implemented this fear of, okay, when you literally you get fined by $500, but we rarely see this enforced. Um, and then like a couple of days ago, no, yeah, a couple of days ago, I was actually uh, writing a comment on a long Facebook thread uh, of someone taking a picture with uh, masks that, you know, COVID-19 is slowly lifting up the restrictions and people are throwing the mask again and everything. It's kind of like humans are the, the, the plague. And I, I actually got very, very mad and angry about it. And I wrote a comment saying that, um, <laughs> saying that you know in a way to curb this is 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 for the government to actually pick up like the mask or the the, the cigarette butts or the plastic the containers and actually go to the lab and find out through fingerprints to find out who's actually person is and then find them and then that kind of idea of fear to, that, that can structure yeah. them can actually stop uh to curb the the the, the littering process you know and I'm not sure if that might work, but it's a bit too harsh for me. But you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. it. It can work. You can drive the fear into them. Like you know, I don't want to, you know, yeah. uh, get fined. You know, but uh, yeah, I think I think through through guilt is definitely not the way. But um, yeah. people know that it's bad. Yeah, I think it's also come down to the mental um, issues about it and the convenience of finding the nearest bin that they can throw it and to finding, you know, um, it's, it's that sort of mental issue that we, we have to deal with and change slowly. But I think it's also because of the generation gap, but, you know, it's different everywhere else in the world. Definitely true guilt and shame. I, I think that's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Next week, you know, we're going to talk a bit more of the solutions if uh, you're free and able and willing to join us again. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show the second video clip. It's shorter. It's only eight minutes. Uh, and so funny, uh, the problem video is like 12 minutes and then the solutions is only eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was it's a bit more hopeful. The second video talk, talked about renewable energies and you know, what different governments are doing. Know, and um, uh, yeah, so we can talk, talk about you know what, what can we do in our little space uh, and, and keep the awareness going yeah. and, and, and Josh can, can, uh, can give a little uh, uh, pitch on uh, the, the glitter club you know because that's, that can be part of the oh, solution yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know in, in how, how we can uh, yeah also to also like yeah, yeah reduce our consumption. Uh, but anyway, that's that's for next week's discussion. Yeah, uh, we've got five minutes. But I'm just wondering, anybody else have any final thoughts or, or comments or, or, yeah.
Kyle's trying to say something. He's so frustrated. I can see it. We can't hear you, Kyle. So sad. I can just see you're so frustrated. You've got, you really want to say something. I'm not sure what the technical issue is there. Uh, but we, 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 we do have these chats uh, once a week. Um, and, uh, and again, thank you to Adrian for convening these. And, uh, and we will keep these on a regular basis. Um, and we, we have got a little one uh, coming up on the 7th as well. I'll send some information about that. So just kind of get your friends to, to come along and, uh, and to join. Um, uh, now, I know Kyle can't, can't talk to us, but he told me earlier that he's looking at doing a beach cleanup in uh, Kotobaru uh, this coming oh. Friday. Uh, obviously awesome. with the social Wonderful. A little bit of social distancing involved and stuff like that, but he kind of, uh, he kind of put it out to his friends and has been amazed uh, with the uh, response that he's got. Uh, so uh, keep it small and stay safe, stay a meter apart, uh, obviously, uh, because, uh, and I know Kotobaru is, uh, is clear and in the green zone now, so uh, which is great to hear, but, uh, but always stay safe. Um, so we'd love to to start building lots of um, lots of little lizard clubs around uh, around our planet. Um, people going out and doing some uh, walking and cleaning up and sharing that uh, as part of our community. And uh, you know, we've, we've just got an amazing opportunity to create an incredible movement yeah. here, and yeah. uh, and for us to do it. And, and, and Kyle, so you're aware we're building an app. Um, that app will be easy for you to be able to send, a, send images to say that there is a lot of rubbish here and, and we'll feed that to community groups so that they can can come and help clean it up if you cannot do it yourself. Um, and then also we'll be working with individuals and community groups, uh, collecting numbers and how much is being picked up uh, and uh, and then rewarding those in that leaderboard. Uh, who have done that. We'll do that on a monthly basis. And uh, some of the little incentives, some of the guys here uh, received a tree uh, over the week. Um, they received their very own tree. Um, so uh, this is a tree that's physically planted in a forest uh, in Indonesia, Philippines, and a few other countries. Um, they get to name their tree. Uh, they get to track where the tree is. They get to meet the, the farmer who's planting the trees on his, uh, on his land and stuff like that. So some of the guys on the call uh, got that this week from Lovers in Action, and this is uh, something we will do to um, again you know, promote our relationship with them, but also to um, reward people for all the hard work that they do. There's some, yeah, just, just cool stuff, and with, with such amazing people on board, and uh, then we will just keep every day trying to do some, do some good stuff. Cool thing. All right, guys, I, I think uh, on that hopeful note, and uh, we'll see you next week. And then we will see the part two of the video and, and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Uh, don't despise humble beginnings. I always believe, you know, even um, little things, it, 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 there's a trickle effect. You know, when people start uh, doing simple things like picking up rubbish, then suddenly they become more aware that, oh, you know, I can reduce my consumption of waste. I can reduce my consumption of, of uh, things. So at least that's my personal experience. Lah. So don't despise the humble beginnings and, and yeah. yeah. So have a great, great week, you know, wherever you are, spread the message. Uh, thanks for joining. And oh, Carl throws the trash at people if they come too close. Okay. <laughs> Stay a meter away. Throw it back at the cars yeah. as they drive past. Yeah. Okay. So see you Thank guys. guys. Thanks guys. Take have care. a great week. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Uh, see you now, guys.